Hi, Gary Stearman. Welcome to another edition of Prophecy Watchers. Once again, L.A. Marzulli is with me, and we're going to talk about giants. <clears throat> giants in the Bible. Everybody knows that giants are mentioned in the Bible. David killed Goliath. Mm -hmm. Sure. Goliath was the Philistines' champion. You know, he's had the armor and the big uh, lance and the sword and all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> Must have been formidable. Maybe 10 feet, 13 feet. I, nobody knows exactly how tall Goliath was, but he was big, scary big. And that's the whole idea. And the giants were evil people in the Old Testament. And we start there, and I'm going to let L.A. Marzulli hold forth because <clears throat> there's a way that the story of the giants elucidates the story of salvation and redemption. And it's a necessary part, I think, of Bible doctrine. What's interesting about the idea of the giants that we read throughout the biblical narrative is they are, in my opinion, we go back to Genesis 6 and we, we, we see very clearly who the giants are. Um, the Nephilim is what we're talking about, way back in Genesis 6. And this, this passage has, is controversial, I'll certainly admit that. There are people who hold to the, tenaciously the position that there's no way um, these are the progeny of fallen angels and the women of earth. Uh, there are others who will admit that, but then say, oh, there's only one incursion, uh, the 200 angels that, that did this are now all in chains. But that's not what the Bible says, in my opinion. What we see are multiple incursions all through um, the Bible. And we go back to Genesis 3, where we realize this, this conversation between Eve, Satan, and the Most High God. The Most High God proclaims your seed, talking about Satan's seed, will be an enmity with the seed of the woman. And that sets up the rest of the biblical narrative, so much so that even in modernity, this is what's happening. But I digress. The giants um, of old, specifically from the Genesis 6 account, and moving forward after the flood. These are the progeny of the fallen angelic host of heaven and the women of earth, which create this unholy union, creates this hybrid being known as the Nephilim. We see th this is the reason for the flood. What I take umbrage in is the movie Noah that came out, which never at all talked about the real reason for the flood. Many Christians have no idea what the real reason of the flood is and the fact that only eight people are saved. There's that salvation message. Yeah. And those eight people, every single one of them, Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives, that, that I'm quoting, which is a proclamation by the Most High God, who was all-knowing and, and is not bound by space and time. And he proclaims, know you, your wife, your sons, and their wives. So all of them, all eight people, their DNA is intact. There's no fallen angel, Nephilim contamination in any of them, and they repopulate the earth. Shortly after that, and not too far afterwards, we get to this weird chapter in the Bible called the Tower of Babel. And what we know happens from that, and I've written about this in the Cosmic Chess Match, by the way, which um, Nimrod becomes a Giborim or a Nephilim through ritualistic sex magic. You can take that, uh, became a mighty man, you can take that and break down the Hebrew and see other interpretations of those words. And it can mean, it could mean that he becomes something else through ritualistic sex magic. In fact, he became a demigod, if you yes. will. He represented himself yes. as a demigod and and started a whole tradition of Baal worship. and, and This is where it comes back in. They open yeah. up the gates again. They open up the portals. And you've talked about this in Time Travelers of the Bible. And you and I have had many discussions about the protocols of heaven. And you'd say, well, why God? Why does God allow it? There, there are protocols which we don't, we get glimpses of them, but right. we don't understand the, the totality of the protocols and, and how it works. We only know that free will is definitely in play here, and the people want to open up the gateways again. And so they succeed in doing that. They do. And this, this is where the second, third, fourth, and fifth incursion, which then happens in Sodom and Gomorrah and happens later on in the conquest of Canaan, where the giants are seen. Now, I want to read one scripture, and then I want to go to the book of Jude. Sure. <clears throat> uh, and, and this scripture we're all very familiar with. It's Numbers 13.33, speaking of the 
12 spies who went in to spy out the land, and 10 of them came back and said, oh, ho, ho, we can't go in there. These guys, these are huge people. They'll, it's like we're grasshoppers, and they look at us as grasshoppers. It says so right here in verse 33, and there we saw giants. I'm reading the King James. The sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. <laughs> the feeling was mutual. Mm -hmm. We felt like grasshoppers, and they looked at us and said, grasshoppers. <laughs> and this is, this is a dire situation. And you can really understand why people would be afraid to tackle these people. Three times uh, in Scripture we have the term Nephilim used in the Hebrew text. Two of them are in this verse. And there we saw Nephilim, the sons of Anak, which come of the Nephilim, which that is were descended from the Nephilim. Now we're talking here about the days of Moses mm -hmm. and there were mm -hmm. Nephilim in the days of Moses. Absolutely. It's right here in Scripture. And this ties in back to the Genesis 6 passage. Moses is the author of Genesis, and Moses states the Nephilim were on the earth in those days yes. and also afterwards. Exactly. Remember, Moses is writing, here's the flood. Moses is writing from a timeline hundreds and hundreds of years after that. If he was writing in, the, in, 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 in proper, let's say, tense in English, he would just say the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, period, because that, that's one incursion. Yeah. We wiped them all out never happened again. But he's writing hundreds of years later, and he knows they're in Milan, and he knows why they're in Milan, and he says it very succinctly in Genesis 6. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim, the fallen host of heaven, saw the daughters of men, went into them in the biblical sense, and had children by them who were the mighty men of renown. And I, what amazes me is, is this truncated view, this anti-supernatural view that so many Christians take, and yet they'll sit there, we will sit there, in church and go, virgin birth, no problem at all. Talking donkeys, yep, I got Mr. Red in the barn. You know, two gold coins that come out of fish's mouth, oh, I had that happen to me last week. Are you kidding me? Staffs that turn into serpents. I mean, the Bible is yeah. filled. Men that walk on water. Men that are swallowed by great fish and regurgitated days later. Jesus walking on water, calming the storm, healing every disease. We believe in this. We travel in the supernatural. We claim to be Christians. We claim to have, when we're born again by the Spirit of a living God, to be, and this is what we offer to people, eternal life and salvation, and all of a sudden the old man begins to guide and the spirit man begins to live as we're taken out of the matrix of the world, the prince of the world, the fallen one. We claim to believe this, and yet, when faced with the supernatural, many of us just stick our heads in the sand and, and we have this anti-supernatural view. And yet, in my opinion... The supernatural is manifesting in ways that I have never seen before. Now, let's take this to another step. And this brings us into our own time. <clears throat> and, and here we go. And this is where the conflict begins in modern Christendom. Uh, L.A. And, and many others are, are talking about uh, the, the, the statement in the Bible, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be uh, in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, meaning there will be a reiteration of everything that happened before the flood in the days just before the, and during the tribulation. Mm -hmm. So we, see, we might uh, be seeing that happen right now, that whole situation developing, and that's your thesis. And you project this. A lot of people have said, no, 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 L.A., you can't be correct on that because Jude says, and I'm looking at Jude, uh, verse 6, which says, and the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. And, of course, this would be the story that we have in Genesis 6-4 and also as told by Enoch. Correct. But left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Now the critic will say, <clears throat> no, no, this can't happen again in our day because all the angels have been imprisoned. All the nasty evil angels are in jail and therefore they were, they're not free to come out and repeat this activity in the latter days. How would you uh, respond? Well, th we know that the 200 watcher angels that descended in the days of Jared in the book of Enoch, which is not part of the canon, I understand that. But Jude, in my opinion, is referring back to Enoch here. That's what he's referencing. And he's talking about those angels. Where is he getting the source of this information from? He's getting it from the book of Enoch. Yes. That's where it's from. He's sourcing the book of Enoch, which is why I think it's important for the church 
church. Okay, it's not part of the canon. I'm not saying it should be, but we should at least read it and understand what Jude is referring well, to. Well, he quotes Enoch a, right. a word he for word. He quotes Enoch word for word. And the bottom line is this. If all the angels are in a gloomy dungeon, which is not the case, only the 200 watcher angels that descended in the days of Jared, those are the ones that are confined. When Jesus descends into the lower parts of the earth, Bollinger talks about this, he, he, it's a proclamation. He goes to those watcher angels and says, no jailbreak, guys. I've got the keys right here. Uh -huh. That's what it is. It's a proclamation when he preaches to the souls that were there and then sets the captives free. But he's preaching to the, he, it's a proclamation to the fallen angels. We know later on in the book of Revelation that it says very specifically, Michael and his angels fight with Satan and his angels. If all the angels are in chains, who's doing the fighting there? So that, that can't possibly have happened because the fallen so, one has not been yet cast out of the second heaven. Plain language time. A lot of evil angels are still in circulation. Absolutely. Maybe millions. Than, yeah, maybe millions. And there's a war going on right now. We read about it in the Bible. And we've sort of been written out of that war by a lot of uh, Bible commentators. But we're in it. We are actually, day by day, living a life of spiritual warfare. Paul talks about it. Uh, you practice this in your own ministry. Sure. And tell others to practice. Put on the armor of God. Put on Absolutely. the armor of God. Well, why would you need to do that? Well, we're at war, right? We are at a war. We are in a war footing. We have been at war. The prince of the... Think about this. In AD 70, um, the, the prince of the power of the air, I believe, Satan himself is whispering in, in the minds of the Romans. And they go down... Uh, with the legions, the Roman legions, and they wipe out Jerusalem. It's a two-prong attack because that's where the nascent Christian church um, is, is, is beginning to blossom. And at the same time, the enemy wants to kill all the Jews, kill all the Christians. That's the goal here. A million people are slaughtered. But, and we, we've, we've actually looked at, looked at some of this. Robert Reland's book is sort of a groundbreaking book with this. You go back in the history, the Christians left the city. Many of the Christians left the city before Titus came in, but we know what happens. This is a direct affront. It's an assault. When we look at the Holocaust, you, a, a case can be made, and I talk about this in the Cosmic Chess Match. This is like a move, counter move. We see that the latter rain begins to fall in Israel at the end of the 19th century. The earthquakes begin to stop. A trickle of the Jews begin to come back into the land. Satan is looking at this and going, ha ha. Prophecy is about to fulfill. All he needs to do is raise up his antichrist of the time, which is Adolf Hitler, and begin to slaughter the Jews, which he, and he almost succeeds, which is terrifying. And by it, the way, the Golden Dawn Society, backing Hitler, really looked at him as the antichrist, the new man. They knew. They knew. He was definitely a type. Yeah. And they almost succeeded in wiping every Jew off the planet. Had they had done that, Israel would never have been reborn. Yeah. Prophecy never would have been fulfilled. God's a liar. Follow me. This is what's at stake. And nothing has changed. He has not been confined to a prison for a thousand years. He roamed. Look at the six o'clock news. Look who's playing this year at the Super Bowl. Katy Perry. Look at the occult symbology uh, and, and just the blatant, in-your-face, occult worship, Madonna, several Super Bowls ago. This is what we're facing. And it's what you talk about all the time. And, and I I'm just praise the Lord that, that he's raised up somebody like L.A. Marzulli to talk about giants. It's not a little subject. It's a big <laughs> subject. And we have here uh, a couple of uh, DVD packages, and they're both entitled Giants. Uh, the first annual Nephilim Mounds Conference and the second Nephilim Mounds Conference. And I participated in the second conference. And my topic here, what is a giant? I talked about what the Bible says about giants. And you know, L.A., nobody ever talks about that. The Bible has a lot to say about what these guys really were. It's not mythology. It's just physical reality. And then the other topic that, that I have on here is uh, it's all about the sea, mm -hmm. talking about the human genome and the battle to preserve mm -hmm. the human genome, which is the heart of the, the battle for redemption of planet Earth, right? Absolutely. And what was incredible about, about this conference, um, your two topics, your two presentations acted as a springboard for us and I, and then we went off. I mean, it's, folks, if you're interested at all, in finding out who the Nephilim were, and in many cases are today, I mean, the, these two 
um, DVD collections are just incredible. They it's really are encompassing. packed with info, and I don't say that because I'm on one of them. I, I say that because Russ Dizdar, L.A. Marzulli, and myself uh, were brought together, I, I think, uh, at a very precise moment in time to deliver this message. Our audience was not super huge, but they were they were moved. They mm -hmm. were enthusiastic mm -hmm. because it finally dawned on them that what the Bible says is a lot more than what is usually read out of Scripture. Usually this stuff is soft-pedaled, like you, you people don't want to know about this. Uh, we don't want to explore this too much because eh, we might learn some things that would be frightening or, or words to that effect. And this is what I run into all the time. I know it's what you run into. Let's go back to Jude. Jude says, the angels which kept not their first estate. In other words, they left the heavens. They came down to earth to set up their own kingdoms, mm -hmm. I think. And we see vestiges of that all over the planet. And you all are, over the planet. You're reading my mind because I was going to go to your adventures in, in the architecture, which you believe is pre-flood architecture. Absolutely. And you went down to Peru mm -hmm. where you saw uh, huge edifices. And I think you very adequately proved that those edifices, which are, by the way, gigantic, could not have been built using any technology known to man today. And you're speaking, of course, of Sacsayhuaman, which is this huge megalithic site in Peru, is about 12,000 feet above sea level. The stones weigh, some of them up to 120 tons. They're dragged from a quarry or moved from a quarry 40, 50 miles away. How did that happen, first off? But then the instead of just a nice joint like this no we don't get that we get a stone and here's the first joint and then the second joint might come like this and the third joint might go up like this and the fourth joint might go down and a fifth joint some of these stones have 12 to 13 14 different angles on them and the other stones that come in and fit to them fit perfectly there's no space literally no space and no mortar use we are looking at a, a type of construction which you cannot, we cannot duplicate in modernity, in the modern age. We cannot do it. Um, you, yes, you can, and we've got diamond saws and drill bits and lasers and all this nonsense. We can duplicate it, but at what price? How much would it cost? And yet in the Neolithic era, thousands of years ago, where all they've got is copper chisels, which can't, by the way, um, you cannot chip away at basalt and certainly not andesite, which is what so Soxiwaman is, and the site's about seven on the Mohs hardness scale. There's no way a, cop a copper chisel will just, just break apart. And, and what's the size, just for reference point, of Saxe Waman? How, bi how big an area does it cover? Oh, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of yards. I mean, it's, it's actually a huge complex, um, and many, much of it has still not yet really been excavated. Maybe nearly at. a mile wide. It's huge. It's huge. It's absolutely and, huge. And it's, it, the whole thing is, is joinery, uh, that you can't even dream about, where you take super hard rock, andesite, mm -hmm. and you, you cut little holes in it and bosses that fit in the holes and curved joints. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's playful. And they did it because they could do it. And yeah. we've come to call this fallen angel technology Nephilim architecture. That's what we've labeled it. And what's interesting is there are sites which I have visited, which I, we talked about some of them in Amitrail 1 and Amitrail 2, but in Amitrail 3, I'm really going to get into this Pumapunku, Tiwanaku, Corral. All these sites talk or, or, or remnants or show a technology which has been lost, an ancient culture, an ancient civilization, which far exceeded what, we, what modern archaeologists give them credit for. And it's a mystery. It, it's incredibly enigmatic. And in my opinion, this is what happened. And this is the basis of our work, our hypothesis. We are looking at the fallen angelic host of heaven coming down and setting up shop, if you will, in an area and being worshipped as a god. And so they create these complexes to themselves. Josephus uh, likens these giants to the demigods of the Greeks, the, the, the mighty men sure. worshipped by the, the ancient Greeks and then later the Romans. And they, in their memory and in their writings, it was, it was fuzzy, but it, it, the, the image was there, the idea that there were super beings who could come down from heaven, occasionally visit earth, take human wives. It was all in their writing. Plato wrote about it as though it really happened. Mm -hmm. And so there was an old world, it's called mythology, but it's actually the truth. 
and I concur with this. And what's interesting is um, the church needs to join the conversation. There's yes. a series on the History Channel called Ancient Aliens, and I've seen most of it. And I, in fact, I was, I was on the first two seasons of this. And they are promulgating the ancient astronaut theory. And they are <clears throat> looking at all these sites and everything that we see and pointing back to E.T. And it's time the church wake up and understand that we are not part of that dialogue. We are not conversing, and we need to converse in it because it is, we are being surrounded by this this theory, this worldview, this paradigm, and it permeates everything in our culture. In our era, L.A., the church is being deemed irrelevant. I think most intellectuals, quote unquote, look at the church as passe. It's gone. It's on. It's dying. It's on its way out. Christians are uh, a weird, dying species. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're standing up against that. I'm standing up against it and say that, one, we're living in a supernatural world. Two, we are at, at, the, at the entrance of the end times. We are moving, ramping up to it. Three, the supernatural is manifesting in ways that I've never seen before. And a modicum of research on the net, on YouTube, can show real video evidence. We actually talk about this and show it in our Watchers series. I mean, stuff is manifesting. The supernatural is manifesting. There are now shows, you know, Ghostbusters and all this stuff on, on, on all these different shows on television. Right. It's all promulgating this. And the church needs to stand up and begin to say what, what these shows really are about. They're about fallen angel technology. They are about the demons who are trapped here on the earth, that the supernatural that is, is manifesting is, for the most part, the dark side that is manifesting. And that we... Christians, because of the book and because of being filled with the spirit of a living God, we've got the answers that the people are looking for. And it's not ancient astronauts from the Pleiades or Zeta Reticula. It's, these are fallen angels, interdimensional beings, which are coming to earth, which is part of what I have come to term or coin as the coming great deception. And we are told this in Scripture, that Satan comes with all signs and lying wonders. I mean, I've said this over and over and over again. But we look at that and we really don't believe what the Bible says. Maybe it's time for you to change the title from uh, the coming great deception to the present great deception. Oh, great because really it's happening right it now. It is happening right now. There is a deception going on. The idea, for example, that the governments of the world are in some kind of communion with aliens from outer space. And we hear this in the popular press all the time. There are whole programs in the media devoted to the fact that, as you say, somebody's here from the Pleiades from Zeta Reticuli, and they, and they are here to bring us the treasures that they have come to offer. Knowledge. Knowledge. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That we're going to offer to mankind. Well, who would who'd turn that down, you know? And, and, and this is what we see. We know for a fact, and, and a, a modicum of research on the, on the net will show this. I keep using those words, but it's true that France, Belgium, uh, the UK, yes. Germany, Mexico, Peru, to name a few, Japan, all have stated that the UFO phenomena is real. And we, we need to come to grips with that. At some point in time, someone is going to stand up in the Oval Office, whoever that is, and announce to the world that we've known about this for decades and that we are being visited and have been visited by extraterrestrials. Again, Jesus says that um, even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. What is he talking about? What could possibly be coming... Like, and, and further, he says, men will faint from fear for what is coming on the earth. What? When we take those, things, those, those two verses and put them together, what is he talking about? What event could he be talking about that, that even the elect could be deceived if that were possible? And, of course, the elect, you know, people can say that's Israel, but we're grafted into Israel, so we're part of that elect. We're born again by the Spirit of a living God, and we're saying that the phenomena that we are seeing of the so-called extraterrestrial is not extraterrestrial. It is, in fact, interdimensional. And these beings are, as, as Jacques Vallée would, would posit, messengers of deception. Indeed they are. <clears throat> I take you back to Daniel and uh, this little word about the Antichrist, Daniel 11.38, but in his estate, that is the estate of the Antichrist, uh, he shall honor the God of forces. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. It's this God that we're talking about. The Antichrist will be backed by these heavenly powers that have descended once again. 
the people on Earth will look at, imagine, place that in the sci-fi realm. Imagine an alien coming down and placing his hand upon the shoulder of the Antichrist and saying, this is the man that we're sending forth to heal the problems of the world. Imagine some scenario like that, and you say, Gary, you are dreaming. No, I'm just reading the prophet Daniel. In his estate, he shall honor the god of fortresses, an evil god. And I would take an, an alien god is going to stand behind the Antichrist, and the Antichrist will appear to have unbelievable power. All signs and lying wonders. Look, it's coming because the Bible tells us it's coming. Yeah. Why, do, why do we shirk from this? Why don't we address it? Why, why aren't we dominating the conversation and, and pointing to the truth of the biblical narrative? Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back probably fairly quickly, fairly soon. I'm not a date setter, but I would say we're in the window of time right. where we're going to see the church raptured from this planet, taken off here in a twinkling of an eye, the blessed hope, and at some point in time, everything is going to change when he comes back, when he returns. Ten DVDs, the Nephilim Mounds Conferences 1 and 2, and just loaded with a great deal of information, uh, much, much more than we have time to convey today. If, if you uh, uh, pick up these two DVD sets, we're going to throw in seven bonus DVDs. These will be lectures by L.A. Marzulli on a number of topics like UFO disclosure, the alien gospel, field manual to spiritual warfare, uh, the alien abduction phenomenon, Many, many more talks along those lines, and you can see right here on the Prophecy Watchers website how you can order uh, these DVD sets. Well, we've got a little over a minute now. Let's, let's kind of put a cap on it. I want to go back to Jude, and I won't turn there, but I'm just going to reference it. Jude 6, the angels that left their first estate thrown in prison. That being the case, then all these things we're talking about can't happen because the angels are in jail. React to that one more time. React to that is simply this, that all the angels are not in prison. Only the 200 watcher angels that Enoch mentions are uh, incarcerated. The rest of the angels are free to roam, and boy, are they Roman. They are everywhere. More and more. more, uh, and more. You and I both follow a number of websites that, re that daily report on uh, UFO sightings, sure. and they are in the hundreds now. They are everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, you have friends that, that have had the experiences. I, in my own church, have people that have seen these things. And uh, they've wondered, what in the world are they? Well, what they are are the forces of the prince of the power of the air who is getting ready for a major assault in the, in the final stages, I think. I would agree. L.A., it's always exciting Thank to you, talk Gary. to you. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate it. Oh, Great listen. to be here. Got to do this again. Absolutely. <laughs> listen, uh, for those of you who haven't studied this subject, it's something that needs to be brought into the Christian dialogue seriously, not in a lighthearted way. It, it all comes under the heading of spiritual warfare. You need to be prepared for what's going on. You need to be personally strong in the Lord. And that's what this is all about. L.A., thanks a lot. Thank you, Gary. I'm Gary Stearman, and thanks for watching. By the way, keep watching, everybody. It's happening.